after only 30, 40 years of globalization, we're now confronting a new world of borders. And in this world of borders, we may have to choose sides. Janice Stein. Thank you very, very much, Morris. Uh, I, it was actually Morris and Motus. There's a secret here. I just explained it to my panelists. We are all Montreal Mafia. <laughs> And you never get over being part of the Montreal Mafia that went up the highway to Toronto uh, so many years ago that I can't remember. So I'm going to kick us off this afternoon with an argument that might actually surprise you. The technology that has made the World Wide Web possible, uh, that held so much promise, that told us that it was going to unite us, that enabled us to go around borders, to cross frontiers, even to go around governments. All of that excitement, it was going to make democracy deeper and richer. If you remember the 90s, that's what we were hoping for. So I'm here with what is bad news. Um, technology is now at the frontier of rebordering our world, of dividing our world. And what I want to do is tell you why I think that way. We need to go back just a little bit because the technology I'm going to talk about today is really at the early stages of the fourth industrial revolution, that orange bar way at the end. What came before? The first one came before, and that was led by steam engines. And steam engines made it possible to navigate rivers and move goods and services much more quickly. It was a connector. And it was followed pretty quickly after by the second industrial revolution. That's a revolution that most of us know a lot more about because that was the electricity-based revolution that enabled factories and mass production and cars to be manufactured, right? Before there were factories, we didn't have cars. Maybe we wish we could wind that one back. Um, but if you think about what factories did, how many of you have ever seen a John Turner painting? Ever seen a John? There was a great exhibition a few years ago. Well, you know those misty, smoky colors that you see in a John Turner painting? Those were paintings of industrial pollution in London. That's why they're so smoky that came out of the factories that the second industrial revolution enabled. And people came, poured into London from the countryside, worked 15 hours a day, lived in unbelievably awful housing. The living conditions were, there's actually no words to describe how bad they were, and were, were the victims of every kind of disease and epidemic because they were so crowded together. That's what the second industrial revolution did. It disrupted society, disrupted the economy, and it disrupted politics. And it took 70 long years for governments to begin to catch up and to put in place some of the social supports that people needed when they were clustered in cities and working in factories. So these industrial revolutions are really disruptive. The third one, everybody remembers that one because that gave you that little handheld device that you have. How many of you have a handheld device? Yeah, right? And when you think about it, that's revolutionary. All of a sudden, you can access information from anywhere you wanted. 
learn about anything, and not only could you learn stuff, and it's all at your fingertips, you could actually do stuff on your computer. That's the digital revolution, which takes us into the knowledge society and the so-called knowledge economy. It's disruptive too. It disrupted work patterns. How many of you work from home? Yeah, well, you couldn't have done that before the digital revolution. There was no way, all right? Um, people work in all kinds of ways now, so that disrupted the workforce. It disrupted our economy. Today, if you look at the stock exchanges in North America, 90% of what is on those exchanges are so-called intangibles. In other words, not real assets, not companies that manufacture, 16% of our economy now is manufacturing, no less. So that industrial revolution really disrupted. Okay, folks, hold on to your hats, because what's coming is the fourth industrial revolution, and we're into it already. You've heard about it. The Internet of Things, which is going to connect everything to everything. Big data, big data analytics, surveillance capitalism, which I know we're going to talk about later today. All of that is around the corner, and it's going to depend on what we call 5G networks. Okay, so let me flip here. And you can just take a peek here, and I've labeled those, all right? You remember that clunky phone on your far left? Yeah, you can smile. People with my color hair remember that phone, okay? You move to 2G, well, they're getting a little thinner, and you can actually move the phone away from the base, but not too far, not too far. If you went out your front door, it didn't work, right? 3G, that looks a lot more like the handheld devices. And that's what really takes us global. Where all of a sudden, and that's when we begin to hear this language, World Wide Web, global, right? 4G gets better. Uh, the tech, we can do more things, and we can do them more quickly, and we actually start using these handheld devices to do work in a serious way. But what's coming? 5G, and 5G is around the corner. We are in 2019 right now, 2021, 2022. Every country Every middle income and every developed country will have 5G networks. So this is not futurology. This is three or four years. And it's 5G technology that is going to enable this internet of things. Because it's so fast and it's so powerful, what's going to run on it? Well, it's not only these applications that we now download from the app stores, it's all our electricity systems will run on a 5G platform. Our nuclear power stations will run on a 5G platform. Our hospitals, every one of our hospitals, our transportation systems, our air control systems, everything, everything will be connected to and based on a 5G platform because it has speed and it's efficient and it's powerful, right? Okay. I'm just leaving that one out there. I'm not gonna say much, but we are already in an all out competition between these two as to who builds that 5G platform. We didn't have that conversation about the World Wide Web. Who built the World Wide Web? Let me tell you, not the world. <laughs> who built it? 
American companies built it. It was, um, it was in fact the American built web. It was built by American companies who put the technology in, developed the applications, wrote the code that all the rest of us use, but that is over. And what we have instead is, and they're on the mat, that's why I love this cartoon, because it says these two countries are going to the mat, all right? And which company is the world leader? Yeah, it's Huawei. Do you know anybody from Huawei that is currently in Canada? <laughs> okay. It's not voluntary on her part, but it's also no accident that she's in Canada. Huawei is in the line of sight of the Trump administration because it is the world's most efficient maker and provider of 5G technology. I'm not talking about Huawei smartphones. That's an entirely different issue. But Huawei, for a whole variety of reasons, in part because of subsidies from China's government, in part because of the scale of China's market, provides the best technology at the lowest price for 5G platforms. And it already has 20%, 28% actually, of the world's 5G market. It's a leader. Wow, the Trump administration. And by the way, this would have come under any US president, frankly. This is not a Trump issue. There were already issues uh, under the Obama administration. So don't mistake what I'm saying. This goes much, whoop. Okay, what was up there? I, I'm looking at the technologists here. There we are. So that dark blue, this is projections for the number of 5G connections by 2025, five years from now, okay? The dark blue is China. The United States is yellow. Now, why do you think the Chinese will have such a large share of the world's 5G connections? Because they have a huge advantage in scale. They have 1.4 billion people in China, all of whom will be using Huawei technology. The Chinese internet is already walled off. We don't have a World Wide Web already. How many, when's the last time any of you brought anything from Alibaba? Not one hand? The last time you bought something from Alibaba, which is the world's largest global e-commerce company, five times the size of Amazon. Anybody buy anything from Alibaba? Okay, one, good, a few. Well, and you know, we have two million Chinese citizens of this country who often buy and transact business on Alibaba. But how was the last time any of you bought anything on Amazon? This morning, okay. <laughs> All right, that's it. Okay, here's the picture. Here's the picture that makes my point. This is a picture of where 5G technology will be built by whom. Let's start on the left. That's, you see us at the top of the left? That's Canada and the United States. That is dark blue. We are the neighbors of the United States. I'm not gonna say anything more than that, right? We have always been the neighbors of the United States. But even go down further into the Caribbean and Central America and South America, The Economist is estimating light blue. Move over Europe. At the top, not all of Europe. Not all of Europe. In part because the Belt and Road Initiative is reaching into Europe and the Chinese government is supporting Huawei in the offers that it makes, which are so attractive to build the technology. But across the Mediterranean Sea, all of Africa will run on a 5G Huawei-built platform. 
Asia, huge chunks of Asia. China, but its neighbors as well, will of course use 5G technology. See the little blue way to the right? That's Japan. And Australia and New Zealand, right at the bottom, are in fact, Australia is the only country other than the United States to have banned 5G technology built by Huawei. That world is divided. That world bordered. The World Wide Web is gone. There is no World Wide Web in the future. So here's what we don't know. When the world is divided into different platforms, right? Onto which ev and everything will run on these platforms. Everything, everything. My biggest worry is that there's going to be an internet of people where chips are implanted under the skin, and that will run on 5G as well, right? But everything will run on these platforms three or four or five years from now. But what if you're in Canada and you want to connect to Africa? How do you get across that border? Where's your digital passport? Who's writing the code to take you across the border? What's the cost of going across that border? We don't have answers to those questions. In fact, when I ask them of our government, that's not what they're thinking about right now. They're preoccupied with issues that they are worrying about today and tomorrow and two weeks from now. And nobody's thinking about the technology, what the technology people in this room would call the protocols for crossing these borders. So here's the irony. The World Wide Web and technology, which opened up the world to so many of us, opened up the world in many parts of the world, in countries like Kenya that jumped, had no landlines, and jumped to mobile telephones and have been, done amazing things because they have the highest cell phone usage of any country. 99% of Kenyans use cell phones. All of a sudden, is redividing, reboarding, refracturing. So the biggest question for all of us is a very old question. How do we navigate across these borders. Thank you.